Hello, this is Elizabeth Claire Brewington, and in my studio today, I have Janice Kephart. And oh my God, this is going to be such a delightful interview and talk, and I, I know all of you are going to enjoy it. Um, she has just released an ebook and an audiobook. Uh, she is almost a voice artist, a beautiful voice. Um, and I think it's about an R plus, but it's really worth listening to. I listened to, to it last night and it was really a wonderful story. And she is going to relate or narrate her grandfather's story, which is the Cherokees of the Smoky Mountains. And I will let her tell you all about it. And let's get to the studio now. So hi, uh, Janice, and thank you so much for giving us your time today. And uh, let's begin with you. Why don't you share the story, your story, and then we'll get into Horace Kepard's story. Well, first of all, Elizabeth Clare, thank you so much for having me. Um, I really have enjoyed uh, speaking to you off camera and glad we're doing this on camera. So a little bit about me. I have about over 20 years working with the federal government doing public service. Um, I was a 9-11 commission counsel. I spent three stints on the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee where I ended as a special counsel. Um, I have written much in my public service career, helped write the 9-11 commission final report and its recommendations, as well as an attending monograph on terrorist travel, which is all in the public domain. On the other side of that very sort of intense career, I am a poet as well and a spoken word artist. So um, I've done a lot of different types of poetry over the years to a lot of different types of music. Um, and this book, uh, this audiobook version of my great grandfather's Cherokees of the Smoky Mountains, um, is really derivative of me studying this book six, seven years ago and using it as a base of a spoken word album. And I decided to come back with all the issues we currently have in this country in regards in our, our racial division. Um, and reading this Cherokee history, it is the only one that exists on the Eastern band of the Cherokees. Um, it's the only written history and it is a very complex history. Um, where there was a lot of division even amongst white people about what happened in the Trail of Tears. And I really think it's incredibly important that people understand what really happened and how the Trail of Tears happened and the incredible disgrace and disjustice that was done to the Cherokees and all the Native American tribes, right? But mm -hmm. this is a microcosm of this story. And it was very personal to my great grandfather because he lived in the Smoky Mountains. He he authored many things about the Smoky Mountains, but he was actually friends with the Cherokees, which was very interesting because they were very um, they had been very friendly with white people prior to the Trail of Tears. But once the Trail of Tears happened, it kind of severed the relationship. So the fact that my great grandfather was highly respected by the Cherokees and very friendly with them made this a book that he could write um, with deep empathy and accuracy because he was so well educated. And he was, he was all, in many instances, he was the only person who was literate where he lived in the Smokies. Um, and so he had a great community backing um, by both the people that live there, the backwoodsmen that live there, as well as the Cherokees. He got along with everybody, really. Um, and he was much revered, actually, and much listened to. He testified before Congress. He's considered to be the founder of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, the first national park in the United States. So he was really a pioneer in very many ways. Um, and yet he had this deep uh, emotional empathy towards humanity. And it really comes out in this book. Um, and I wanted to bring it back to life. I wanted people to understand that Empathy can happen even in the early 1900s with, with a white man, right? That, um, that the Cherokee history was much more complicated than, than people imagined. People probably don't know the Cherokees are the only Native American tribe that had their own written language that they created themselves. 
they figured out how to do and was much simpler than the English alphabet or any other alphabet out there. So it's a, a fascinating, uh, deeply respectful mode of history that, and it's short, it's like the audiobook's like 80 minutes. Um, and it's just something I think every American needs to hear. They need to understand this history. Um, and, it, you know, I just don't believe this is even about me or my great grandfather at this point. This is about our country and what we need to understand so that we can move forward properly amongst each other. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think I think this I I, I, I heard about this uh, written word and this language. And I think it's because of people like your grandfather that have documented this story that we have some historical evidence. So I think mm -hmm. he definitely gets the credit for documenting this because without that, we would not know all these details. And so we are extremely grateful. So let's, uh, that goes to my next question. So let's go back to Horace Kepard, um, right. who he was and, you know, how did he get about writing this book? And let's just, just for a minute, just go back into his world and understand where he came from and why he gave us such a treasure with this document and gave you so give us and you're such a treasure to us to tell us the story yes oh well thank you um i'll do the best i can uh from the research that i've done and i have other family members who have done quite a bit of research as well and his name is well known so there's lots of written about Harz kephart but what i know and and what i believe is that the deep seed of compassion he had from humanity really came from his parents, who um, his father was the chaplain to the Union Army appointed by President Grant. Um, he grew up with that father and so and his mother. And so even when Harz Kephart in the late 1800s has a mental breakdown, his father comes to his aid and helps him um, by eventually having him camp in the Smoky Mountains. And after a while, his father left and his son stayed and he never, he never went back. So all that learning that my great grandfather had, he had gone to Boston College and Cornell and graduated at 17 and then been Yale University's librarian, then asked, then went to Italy to be a curator of some rich Italians um, uh, library full of antique books, and then came back and was asked to be the librarian in Missouri of the Mercantile Library, which was at the time the largest U.S. library um, west of the Mississippi River. So it was in St. Louis. Is that east or west? Okay, in St. Louis. So he then has six children. He's about 30 years old, um, loves his wife, but he begins to, the library is too confining for him. He starts going into the Ozark Mountains. He's drinking too much. His wife doesn't know where he is. He's, she's trying to take care of six kids by herself. And eventually he just has a complete mental breakdown. And um, he leaves a note at a bar um, and the bartender opens it and it's a suicide note and he's walking towards a bridge and they, they, they stop him. And that is when his parents came into the picture and with his wife agreed that he would go back home. He never ever lived with his six children or wife again. And they never divorced. They stayed in love and she supported him. Despite being a woman in the early 1900s, having to support herself back in Ithaca, New York by herself. So the deep humanity that I think that my great grandfather had really evolved from the love of his own parents um, and the love of his wife that enabled him to flourish despite this. So really what happened was, and this is the way I think of it, he became the librarian of the Smokies. He archived everything. He took pictures of measuring his shoes, his that he made himself, his kept the famous Kephart knife, the bullets. He would write articles about, you know, what type, exactly the science of making a bullet so that it would penetrate the skin of an animal in a particular way. It was intense. Well, so, let me stop you there. Yeah. Famous knife. Let's look at this yeah. knife and talk, <laughs> go into it. 
because this okay. is a big part of your grandfather's story and legacy as well. Yeah, it is. It's it's very interesting to me, um, you know, all of this. So this is the Kephart knife. And this is an article from relatively recently, I believe. This is, there are apparently two original Kephart knives. And this is one of them. And this article talks about like, how excited these people are to actually have this Kephart knife in their hands. Yeah. There are dozens of replicas of the Kephart knife. It's probably one of the most famous knives in American history. And this was the knife that he used, um, you know, this was the knife that he used um, $2 back in the day <laughs> with a replica of it. Um, but this is, this is about that. So it was used for everything by him. When he was a survivalist in Deep Creek for two years, he, he went to an area of the Smokies that is now even so remote that it's almost impossible to get to. And he lived in, it was on near the peak of a mountain and he is called Deep Creek. And he lived there for two years by himself. So in that time, he taught himself many things. So one of the things, Camping on Woodcraft is one of his most famous books. This is all about how to survive on your own in the wilderness. And this was the original Boy Scout manual. This was used as the baseline for the Boy Scout manual. So I think that's pretty cool. Then he also archived, and if you go to the Western Carolina University, it was extremely helpful to me when I was doing my work here on all of this. They have a digital library online for Kephart. They all, you can also physically go to their archive. Um, and they have, he did maps. He did detailed maps of the Smokies. He listed every single peak. And I have these in the Kindle version of the audiobook, listing every single peak in the Smokies, exact height by the foot. He designed his own furniture. He designed his own shoes. He designed the cabins. He designed, you know, he had a lot of time on his hands. He was all by himself with his focus, right? Um, but he also, oh, you're on mute. Yes, sometimes uh, when people are creating or developing, they separate themselves from, you know, their responsibilities. And this goes back to my Indian roots. Like when I was growing mm. up, we had servants so that we could study and pay attention to academics. That's why you see a lot of brilliance with, you know, people from other countries, because we didn't do any, you know, we didn't even make our own beds or comb our own hair or whatever. Everything was done for us. And all wow. we did was go to school and study. That was our job, uh, you know, and, and as a result, uh, you know, there comes a time when you have to do that so that you can you focus. So this is a this is a guy that was a genius and he he was archiving things yeah, pretty and much <laughs> yeah. into the world and I I think the cap and knife was absolutely great um and then let's uh let's uh let's go look at the map it may not be the okay, map sure but the map sure. so let's understand yeah. this area that he was in and right. then we'll come to the Smoky Mountains uh you okay know, sure dedication. let me just say the other thing that he archived were the people. The people yeah. of the Smokies. And so I'll show you the map in a second, but our Southern Highlanders was wow. a bestseller in its day. And it's the only written text of the culture, I will call it, of the backwoodsmen of the Smokies. Largely illiterate, highly feudal. Um, you know, he he actually makes a little bit of fun of them in this yeah. book um, because they're they they hurt each other a lot and yet they they really struggled to survive they did not have the skills to survive that the cherokees did there's an incredible juxtaposition between the cherokees and what they were able to survive and thrive in the smokies and the scottish and german immigrants that came in behind them so this this documents them their songs their language he translates their language because you can't understand them because they've been basically isolated in the smokies and their language is all strange so it's, it's very, very interesting. And then I'll just show you this. And then this is the original Cherokees of the Smoky Mountains. Wow. So this was just a pamphlet published posthumously because this was not published during his lifetime. This was published by his widowed wife. So let me show you where Kephart now, these, was. These three books, are they available in the library or is there? Sure, there yeah, you can. There are many, many versions of these books that are available. So um, 
And yeah, there are many versions of every single one of these books. And in fact, Amazon, when they put up my audio book, put it in with the original version. Oh, nice. So I actually synced my audio book to my version of this and they unsynced it because they put mine in with the original version. Oh, so that's yeah, fun. so that's just so people know that um, yeah. why I made it so it would be whisper sync, but they Amazon did not allow that to happen. Yeah, because wow. the other versions exist. That sounds amazing. And um, actually, so yeah, so because we we were talking earlier about linking, so we'll make sure that when we write the blog and the story, uh, we linked correctly so people can follow this video and and link to the right things and, and discover more than I've discovered. So this is amazing. Now let's talk about the Great Smoky National Park and then you're going to show me a map. Yeah, I'm going to show you the map. So Horace Kephart was well known in his day, right? And he was very, very well respected and known outside the Smokies. He's the one that got Senator Rockefeller geared up to support making the park a national park. So, um, one of the things that ended up happening, which is very interesting, is the U.S. Geological Society during his lifetime said, we would like to name a mountain after you, pick your mountain. So um, I actually have two images here I want to show you. Um, the first is the letter, and this is in the Kindle version of the book. Um, the first is this letter. Oh, wow. And I don't know how well you can see it. But I the can letter, see it pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. The letter is from my great grandfather to his family. And it says, um, you know, I, as you will see, and there, there apparently was an enclosed copy of the notification from the U.S. Geological Board. We Keparts are now, and this was my great grandfather's sense of humor. We Keparts are now amongst the quote unquote higher ups. Um, at this same meeting of the board, a mountain in South Dakota was named for President Coolidge. Cow's Hill is only 6,000 feet high. Ours is 6,255. 6, so we can't help looking down on him, but let's not be supercilious about it, um, which is just kind of amusing and shows that he had a great sense of humor. And actually, what I learned from this is that my sense of humor is not mine. I have his DNA because it's like exactly my sense of humor <laughs> as wow. well. <laughs> um, so he, then let so, me show you I'll should go ahead and show you the map yeah. um, okay so if you look here you can't see too well but the the Tennessee I'll make this a little bit bigger and I'll hone in just a little bit more the Tennessee North Carolina uh, boundary runs right through Mount Kephart Okay. So he's looking out on Tennessee on one on the left and North Carolina on the right. If you take this down, take this down a little further, you'll see that Cherokee, North Carolina and Kuala boundary that we yes. talk about in the audiobook are right down here. Now, this looks far away, but it's only seven miles. This is actually only seven miles. Okay. And then Bryson City is the place where he's buried and where he lived um, after he left living in seclusion. This area, see this boundary? This is all yeah. Cherokee in here. This okay. is the current Cherokee boundary in here. Um, Lake Unaluska, he's, uh, you might remember that name from the yeah. audiobook. He is one of the chiefs as well. So um, that, so this whole air, area, but the Cherokees actually, and I have an image of this from the Tennessee archives in my book, the Cherokee original boundary was all the way up here, Ohio, Virginia, all the way down here in Georgia, part of Alabama, most of Kentucky, and Georgia. so it was massive, massive. It was the entire Smoky Mountain Range and a lot around it as well. And that was the original Cherokee territory. Wow, amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. Now, this uh, park that's de dedicated to him, I, it, that's awesome that it's called Mount Kepa. So uh, the park that's dedicated to him as well. Uh, so you are, you, your family has been doing a lot of work to keep his name up there. And now you're getting involved with the Cherokees of the Smoky Mountains. Uh, so 400,000 years ago, yeah, they lived in the Cherokee. The Cherokees had that territory for 40,000 years before they were forcibly removed. Um, and they were completely 
economic, no economic debt. They had inns, they had roads, they had uh, an entire culture that was actually matriarchal, really. If you married into Cherokee, you went to the wives' homeland. You did not go to the husband's homeland, which yeah. is very different from many cultures, right? Yeah. Um, women could be warriors in the Cherokee culture. They had uh, Sequoia is very famous for establishing the Cherokee alphabet and Cherokee language. And as my great grandfather describes it, you could learn Cherokee, written Cherokee in, in about a week, uh, which is very different from any language that's ever been done. Um, yeah, they were, and they were very peaceful. They were very peaceful with the exception of maybe the Creeks <laughs> that they didn't <laughs> like too much, the other Native American tribes. They had some issues with the other Native American tribes. And maybe their biggest downfall early on was they kept picking the wrong, every, when the French and the English were fighting, they picked the wrong side. Wow. When the English and the colonists were fighting, they picked the wrong side. Wow. And so they were constantly getting um, really put in bad positions by the alliances that they were choosing politically. Um, it wasn't until they had a, a chief that was highly educated in regular American society a uh, regular immigrant, U.S. white immigrant American society who was seven-eighths Scottish and only one-eighth Cherokee, who married a Cherokee woman and became complete Chief John Ross, who for 50 years was their, their chief all through the Trail of Tears and afterwards. He was incredibly well-educated, articulate. Andrew President Andrew Jackson was quite afraid of him. They Andrew Jackson did everything he could to keep John Ross away from the floor of Congress to speak because he knew if that happened, the Cherokees would be able to keep their land um, because they were forcibly removed with a sham treaty, basically. Um, so they're just, their, their downfall probably was their, some poor decisions on alliances early on um, and trusting some really greedy white men a little too much they really were a warm welcoming they welcomed white many white people into their society um yeah it, it's just it's very very interesting um they were almost too nice honestly oh you're mute again and, and it's so much that we can learn from this uh book as well um so i want to say that we were going to play uh the music and then we'll just come back and summarize the interview and then we'll close. Uh, maybe we'll take a moment of silence and think about these lives that were so yeah. destructive. They lost one quarter of the Cherokee population during removal exactly. because of the poor, poor conditions yes. they were forced to be in. And yes. there was at least one general that, that was that was ordered to remove them that quit. There were normal, numerous um, white generals under President Jackson who refused to carry out the orders and quit. Yeah. They didn't want to be part of it. Um, yeah. People said that, you know, they had been through many wars and they had never seen anything as cruel as what has happened to the Cherokees. So, um, yeah. So let's go to the clip and listen to the music and then okay. come and give a moment of silence and then I'll let okay. you reflect on something you want to talk about yeah okay so let me um let me pull up i i think the better i know that this is available on youtube but i think the better the sound is a little bit better off my website it might just be zoom so let me just set this up for a little bit so um i, I originally i can play it from your website hold on what is your um what is your website it's janiskepartmusic.com uh, why is it not taking me there? Hold on. Uh, let's do it again. It's not letting me because we were sharing too much. All right, we can do that later. Uh, well, let's just take a moment of silence and um, let's reflect on these lives and uh, and say a prayer for the the families that still are here with us, and we're so grateful to that. Uh, 
All right. Looks like you've got it going. Good girl. So let's <laughs> listen to the so, music. Yeah, this is, um, this was just a photo shoot I did for, to help support the album. So the album, so I originally, I've gone a little bit backwards in this project. I originally read and studied the text that my great grandfather wrote. And then as a spoken word artist, I used it to, um, to really help me visualize a series of characters um, and create what I call Cherokee voices, um, the spoken soundtrack of the Trail of Tears women. So through this, it's a historical chrono chronological um, relation of voices of Cherokee women before, during, and after the Trail of Tears. Um, and it is, uh, here is the CD, and then I have a vinyl size version of it, of the book. Uh, I don't know, it keeps going in and out, but um, in here, what I did was each, each song, which is spoken, each song has a historical introduction that's spoken, and then comes in the music. And I don't sing, I speak, but I think the most dramatic one um, and the one where you hear the music, which is so powerful. Um, the music was done by my friend, Buddy Spear at 38 North Studio. Uh, there are about 78 tracks in each one of these, um, each one of these music tracks has about 78 tracks that build it. We had an internationally renowned um, uh, Indian flautist, um, who native Indian flautist who provide the fluting. Um, we used um, Indian drumming um, and we tried to recreate the feeling of being in the Smokies at this time the best we can. So what I'll do is I'll play the introduction so you can get the historical set and then it'll go right into the actual song. It's a long song. So if you want me to stop it midway through, I'm happy to do it do that okay. if you just want me to just do like the first stanza or something yeah but her the, the first story. stanza would be good and yeah then, and we can think about how we want to use the song later yeah okay so yeah so this is um a maiden warrior she her tribe has decided to go against they've just made a decision that they're going they want to stay in their homeland and they will do what they need to do to make that happen so she's contemplating the possibility that she might have to go to war the next morning. So that's what this is. Um, so I'll just play this. It is early 1838. Individual Cherokee Nation tribes are deciding whether to stand their ground and battle for their territory and their honor or allow themselves to be removed forever from their homes in the Smokies. The Georgian troops are carrying out Jackson's orders and Cherokee scouts tell of their approach tribes prepare for battle. The woman who govern the Alcana Lofty tribe have chosen a maiden Cherokee warrior to prepare for battle. The maiden warrior goes to a scout's lookout to prepare her mind and her heart. Beautiful, yes. All right, so let's come back. Stop. stop. Yeah, stop sharing and we come back. Okay. Oh, stop sharing. Sorry. <laughs> I, okay. just stopped the, I just stopped the sound and didn't stop sharing. Sorry about That's okay. that. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to, I'm going to share my thank you screen uh, and then I'll stop and then we can talk about other things uh, in a minute. Um, so here I am with Janice Kepart and we'll make sure you have the links to her website and all the videos that we've been doing will be on our blog. Uh, so look for that and we'll make sure we'll let you know where you can order all these lovely books and and music and uh, poetry. And she's so very talented. Um, and let me um, get to the next slide. And thank you for watching our channel, uh, supporting it. Uh, we are now a podcast as well. So we thank you, thank you, thank you. And please, if you haven't subscribed or this is the first time you've landed on this video, make sure you subscribe. You're not going to want to miss all the things that we have in store. So 